evening. A uh, few quick updates. Most announcements were covered this morning, but um, Akeem, I, I sent him a text shortly before we left the house. He sent me, asked him how he was doing. He sent me back, okay, just really drained. So he's, he's holding his own. Uh, those who weren't here this morning, he's been, he was diagnosed with COVID yesterday. So um, he's isolating in the camper, which isn't a, that's not a great big step for him. <coughs> um, but he, he seems to be doing all right. Um, we're ha- remind you that next Sunday evening, and I hope it's not this dark next Sunday evening. Um, it's overcast. Um, we may have to think about that. Uh, well, we could, lights are out there too. So, anyway, we'll deal with it. Uh, next Sunday evening, we're having our, a song service out by the, is it song service? Nope. It wasn't going to be. Yep. Well, it's the last Sunday of the month. So, yeah. Song service next Sunday evening. Outer and the neighbors will be out here singing, assuming the weather's good. Out around the fire barrel, we, uh, out around the, the, the fire, uh, and, a, and a potluck afterwards. Um, have that out there. Uh, was it carry in or something like that? Oh, there's, there's potluck on here. <laughs> um, uh, um, out there, to, and, and we are expecting, uh, Dave commented this morning that we, we mentioned it to some of the people that were on the train robbery, and there were several of them that had, you know, they asked about the congregation here, uh, because Scott and Dave and I were all three involved in it, and, uh, you know, we invited uh, Dave more than we invited them to, to come on that Sunday evening, and several of them talked like they would consider doing that. So, and when you're, and when you're planning food, kind of keep that in mind that we could have some extra people. So we don't want to don't want to have to ration food. Um, something else I was going. Oh, in relation to that, there's a sign up out there on the sheet. On this, right, that was the other thing. I, there's a sheet out there on the door. Uh, there's still there's still plenty of stuff available uh, there to sign up for what you're planning on bringing. And there's also some um, chores, uh, things that need to be done to get ready for that. Um, just, just some minor things, wiping, wipe, cleaning up the garage needs done a little bit, and the tables need wiped off, and some of that kind of stuff needs done between now and then. Uh, uh, November 19th, it looks like uh, uh, ornament exchange at the Neal House. Um, that's at 6 p.m. That's on November 19th. If everything goes as planned, Lonnie and I will be leaving a week from Wednesday and going to California for the adoption. I keep us in your prayers and that everything goes smoothly with the adoption. Uh, it would take something pretty major to put a glitch in that at this point. Um, but we'll be gone for about a week. Any, any other updates? Or? Okay. 6.30 at the Ornament Exchange on the, on the 19th of November. Any other updates or anything, any updates on the ill or any other announcement that need to be made? If not, those taking uh, leadership roles, uh, Bernie's going to have the opening prayer and can take care of the table if necessary. There is necessary. And Scott's going to lead the singing. Dave's going to have the sermon. And Bobby's going to have the dismissal prayer. bow with me. Dear God, our Lord and Father in heaven, we're thankful, Father, for being able to be here this evening. We're thankful for all of your blessings, and we're most indeed thankful for your son. We pray, Father, that you would be with Brother Dave as he delivers the message this evening, that you would help him, that he might be able to have a ready recollection of what he has to say, and that we would be able to learn much from his lesson this evening. We pray, Father, that you would be with those on the prayer list, that you would bless and strengthen them. We pray, Father, that you would especially be with uh, Jim and Nancy Pettit and be with uh, Jerry and Kathy Turns and Larry and 
Shu McKenzie, uh, there are others, dear Heavenly Father, I, I know who they are, but I can't think of their names, and you know who they are, and I know you know their names. We ask you, Father, that you would go with us through this service and through our lives, and please forgive us for our sins, and in death save us if we're found faithful. So that's a prayer we'd ask in Jesus' name. We're going to sing, I, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. We'll sing that. It's found in book 171. We'll sing that and then uh, have communion for those that missed out this morning. time those who was unable to be here this morning has the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. We would ask you to let your mind go back to the cross of Calvary and see Jesus our Savior as he suffered and died on that cross and realize that the bread you are about to partake of represents his body and the cup, the fruit of the vine, represents his blood. Dear God, 
our Lord and Father in heaven. We're thankful, Father, for your Son, and we're thankful, Father, for all your blessings. We pray, Father, that you would bless this bread. We ask you, Father, that you would be with those who are partaking of the Lord's Supper this evening. We ask you, Father, that you would help them to let their minds go back to the cross of Calvary and see your son as he suffered and died on the cross. Once again, Father, we pray that you would bless this bread and be with those partaking of it. In this prayer we'd ask, in Jesus' name, amen. God, our Lord and Father in heaven, we continue to ask your blessing upon this cup, the fruit of the vine. We pray, Father, that you would help the ones partaking of it to see the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. And we ask you, Father, that you would be with them as they partake of the cup. For this prayer we'd ask in Jesus' name. going to sing This Is My Father's World. Again, it's song number eight in the blue book. We're going to sing This Is My Father's World. <clears throat> this is my father's world and to my listening ears all nature sings and shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. Yay! Yay. <laughs> now 
are going to sing Faithful Love. It is in the black book, if you would like to follow along. It is in the black book, but it is not in the blue book. So if you uh, want to, you can follow along on the screen above. Faithful Love. I assume everybody has a copy of the scriptures for this evening. Mike told me a long time ago that Sunday night worship is different. Sunday night sermon is different from a Sunday morning sermon. Sermon, uh, and rest assured that uh, this is not going to be a Eutychicus type thing where we stay in here until midnight. And when I handed the outline to of the of the scriptures to Char, she asked if if she should have brought her breakfast. But no. <laughs> I'll be referring to these scriptures. I'm not going to be reading all of them that you have in front of you, but I wanted to make copies so that you had them uh, so that you can do some study on your own if you so desire. And to the folks at home, if you would like to have a copy of the scriptures, please text me, and I will get that to you. I ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians in the area of chapter 12, 13, and 14. Because in this area, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, <clears throat> The chapter uh, Paul is talking about here, the subject Paul is talking about here, is that of spiritual gifts, that of healing, miracles, prophecy, and tongues. These are all difficult subjects to deal with, so that's the reason I'm kind of rushing through this a bit, but I want you to have the scriptures to support uh, what the Bible teaches. But in chapter 12, Paul's talking about those spiritual gifts that were unique to that time of healing, mir uh, miracles, prophecy, and speaking in tongues. In chapter 13, he reveals how long that they would last. And we'll talk more about that later in uh, the lesson. Chapter 14, he provides a guideline for those who used those spiritual gifts in their worship at that particular time. And in uh, uh, chapter 14, verse 26, the last part of that verse, talks about those gifts were used, the purpose of those were for edification. And I, like I said, we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. In the course of his uh, of Paul's discourse, though, his, uh, he proposes an excellent way, a more excellent way 
1 Corinthians chapter 12, the very last verse in that chapter, verse 31, uh, says this, but earnestly desire the best gifts. Now he talked about what spiritual gifts were before leading up to this point, but he says, I want you to earnestly desire the best uh, gifts. And he goes on to say, and yet I show you a more excellent way. So there's, there's, a, there's a change here in the way that he's approaching this subject of spiritual gifts. I tell you, he says, I want to show you a more excellent way. So in chapter 13 then, we find that more excellent way as Paul carefully and beautifully defines what it is. Paul explains uh, love as being divided into basically three parts. And we're going to look at those uh, this evening, but now let's look at chapter 13 as we read those uh, first 13 verses of that. Well, I guess it's the whole chapter, isn't it? Though I, verse 1, though I speak with, uh, with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and, th and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though be I bestow all my goods <coughs> to feed the poor, and though I give my body as a burnt to be burned, but have not love, <clears throat> it profits me nothing. Love suffers long, is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is <clears throat> not provoked, thinking, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understand as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see uh, in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part. But then I, will, I shall know just as I am also, uh, as I also am known. And now abides faith, Hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, this is what Paul was leading up to saying in the, that, that, that verse 36 uh, of the, or I'm sorry, the verse 31 of that last chapter, where he said, I want to show you a more excellent way. And he's talking about the necessity of love here. And it's actually uh, broken up into uh, some parts here that I want to help, uh, that I want to hopefully uh, explain. One is the necessity of love. Another is the qualities of love and then the permanency of love. And we see that as we look through those verses. But we're going to get back into those verses. And the first part of this is in the necessity of love as described by Paul in his 13th chapter. Love is necessary in the exercise of spiritual gifts. That's what he's telling these people here. Now you have to understand he's talking to the church then, and we'll see what that develops as, as things uh, progress over time. But love is necessary in the exercise of the spiritual gifts, the first two verses of chapter 13. Love is necessary in the exercise of the great sacrifice in verse 3. He said, even if I offer myself as a burnt offering and don't have love, I am nothing. Without love, such things are of absolutely no value, is what Paul is saying. So how do we understand this love for us today? Because it's, it's, I suggest to you it's not quite the same as what it was in first century time as people were trying to grasp what, what they were uh, living by. But how do we understand it? Without love, any ability that we have, I'd suggest, 
is of little value. Now you name the ability, such as maybe preaching, teaching, you know, whatever the ability might be, without love, it is of little value, using the principles that Paul talked about here. Without love, any knowledge. Now referring to the knowledge that we might gain as a as trying to comprehend and think of it that we get uh, above and beyond what the scripture teaches. Any knowledge we obtain will hurt us. It puffs us up according to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. It puffs us up, but love edifies, is what Paul said there in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Without love, any service rendered is not pleasing to God without love. Revelation chapter uh, 2, the first five verses John, by inspiration, talks about that early church at Ephesus, how that they had lost their first love. And when you lose that love, that, that purpose, it's not pleasing to God. But what is love exactly when we think about this? That leads us to the, the second point of Paul's discussion of that more excellent way in which he describes the qualities of love. And in these qualities, there are actually two parts that are broken this down uh, into uh, there are some positive uh, qualities, and there's also some negative qualities. So going back to our text of 1 Corinthians 13, follow along if you will. In verse 4, he says, under the positive qualities, he says that love suffers long. What's he mean by that? It endures uh, slights, it endures wrongs, patiently and longly uh, trying to be like God. It endures those things that are, that are a problem in this world. Uh, Psalm 103, verse 8, uh, says that the Lord is merciful, is gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. Verse 4 also says it is kind, it's obliging, willing to help, willing to assist wherever possible. That's the definition of love and as being kind in that positive sense. Well, in a negative sense, verse 4 gets into that. It says love does not envy. It is not jealous of what others have or what they've become. That's not it at all. It's not envy. In that same verse, it does not parade itself. It does not brag. It does not boast. It does not elevate itself uh, above uh, uh, one somebody else's abilities or their positions. It just doesn't do that. He says it's not puffed up, swelled with pride. That's what he's talking about. It's not swelled with pride. It's, it's elated to, uh, to be happy and not puffed up in a vain conceit. Verse 5 goes on to talk about does not, that love does not behave rudely, to behave in an ugly manner, indecent, unseemingly, unbecoming. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says to be courteous. Peter says to be courteous. Verse 5 says does, does not seek its own. Well, love does not seek its own happiness. Uh, to the Injury of somebody else, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 24 and verse 33. It says it's not provoked. It does not fly off into rage. It keeps its temper and under control. That's what a definition of love is. Thinks no evil. You know, it's, it's easy to be critical, you know, when you're on the outside looking at a situation. It really is. But it says, doesn't, he says it doesn't think evil. It puts the, the best possible construction <clears throat> on the motives and the conduct of others, not maliciously, not fault-finding, but it thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquities, also in that verse 5. It does not rejoice over people who have a vice about something of other people. It does not delight when, when people are found guilty of a crime. It doesn't delight in that. It doesn't delight in the fact when somebody falls into sin or some, when somebody is actually identified as being in sin. It doesn't delight in that. Love doesn't delight in that. Well, what about on the, the positive qualities of love? In verse 6, it says it rejoices in truth. Now, truth is, in, is the embodiment of love. You should know the truth and it will set you free, right? And when love sees truth proven in people's lives, then love greatly rejoices along with that because they found the truth. Second John chapter, well, Second John 4, there's only that one chapter. And in Third John, there's only one chapter, it's verses 3 and 4. Verse 7, it says, bears all things. <clears throat> 
So it covers, protects, uh, that is used by Paul elsewhere. He also says that it endures. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12, and 1 Thessalonians 3, 15. So as we regard other people and how they deal with things, we need to be patient. We need to be understanding. Verse 7 says it believes all things in regard to the conduct of others. Uh, when, uh, when people find themselves in situations uh, that maybe we, we, we believe that they're acting in good faith and they're, they're motivated by good intentions and not to injure somebody else by what they've done. Verse 7 also says it hopes all things that that in that hope that all will turn out well. And I know that's difficult sometimes to think about that all things will turn out well when things are, are going upside down for you. That happens to folks. Um, but it also uh, would refer to in hopes of all things that this also means and refers to the conduct of other people, that their intentions are good, that they are working for uh, the, the betterment. So hold on to this hope for other, other people as well as for herself. But love will do this because it delights in the virtue and the, and the happiness of others and will not uh, credit anything to the contrary unless, obviously, unless there's something that's uh, 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 yet to be understood. So the final quality of love that Paul talks about here induces us to the section of, of that more excellent way about the permanency or the ongoing fact of love. In verse 8, love never fails. Never, it never fails. It never falls away. It, it never stops. <clears throat> it never is without effect. It never ceases to be in existence. Love never fails. Well, the other spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit of that particular day uh, would soon cease and be valueless. Love would abide, and love would always exist. The argument is that we ought to, to seek that which endures, that value that endures, and that therefore love should <coughs> be preferred to those spiritual gifts on which there is a high value by the Corinthians because that's what the whole subject was about, the, these spiritual gifts that were being imparted to those people at the particular time. And Paul's making the statement that love never fails. Spiritual gifts, those prophecies, those uh, healings, those, that knowledge that they thought that they had, those tongues. Can you imagine, <clears throat> can you imagine <laughs> Paul in traveling on those missionary journeys and others as they went about teaching the gospel, as they went about planting congregations in various places. Can you imagine the difficulty that we would have uh, in speaking that many different languages today? Paul didn't have that trouble because of his abilities, the spiritual gift that he had, the spiritual gifts. But those spiritual gifts would vanish away. It's what the 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 12 says, and Paul said that. So such gifts were... To, to reveal and to confirm the word. That's the reason for those spiritual gifts, to reveal and confirm the word of God. Mark 16, verse 19 through 20, and Hebrews 2, uh, verses 3 through 4. Now, I want you to notice something with me here. Once the word was completely revealed, once the word was completely confir confirmed, the need for the spiritual gifts ceased. Now, a lot of people today would argue that all we speak in tongues. You know, that's, that's, what, that's what the Bible says. Well, some people babble, <laughs> and some people speak in foreign languages, yes. But by the miraculous work that was being done through the Holy Spirit in that first century, uh, that spiritual gift ceased. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, and Jude 3. Those things came to an end. Why? Because the word of God was completely revealed, and it was confirmed. So love abides. Faith, hope, these three, according to 1 Corinthians 13, 13. But the greatest is love. Spiritual gifts, like the prophecies, like the tongues, like the knowledge, would cease. Yes, they fulfilled their purpose. 
Yet the virtue of faith, hope, and love abides, remains, dwells, does not go away. It continues. It endures. There was a time for those spiritual gifts and the fulfillment of that hope, that love. But love is greater than uh, those things that were mentioned. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. So as we live our lives now, of course, we walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And we hope for what is unseen, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 24 and 25. Yes, we hope for what is unseen. We hope for that heavenly home. We, we hope for the promises of God, the things that, are, that you can't literally reach out and pick up. We hope for those things. But when Christ comes, the need for faith, the need for hope, will be no more. We will then walk by sight and not by faith. We will see that which we have eagerly awaited and no longer need hope. Yet throughout eternity, in the presence of Christ, love never fails. I remember one time uh, in reading through these verses, I got in kind of a hurry uh, some time ago about reading how Paul may have said these things about love. And I thought about that quite a bit. So I'd like to tell you my impression of what or how <clears throat> that Paul may have expressed these words. <clears throat> As you come down to verse 4, he says, because he's, he's talked about the spiritual blessings that's going to stop <clears throat> as far as the prophecies and the, and the healings and the tongues and that sort of thing. And then transitions to love. In verse 4, love suffers long and it is kind. It does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. does not seek its own is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. So as Paul conveys this message to the church there, and to us as well, Love truly is a more excellent way over what was going on in first century time that he talked about in, in verse 31 of the previous chapter. The fulfillment of the law is what he also said about love. In Romans chapter 13, verse 8, he also said in Colossians 3.14 that it was a bond of perfection. When properly defined, when properly understood, love is always the way of Christ. It's his way. For in Paul's description of love, we certainly see the true character of Christ. As disciples of Christ, we're to walk in the same way as he walked in love as well. Ephesians chapter 5, the first couple of verses, we're to imitate Christ. So the question that I have for all of us, self-included tonight, is how does our conduct measure up in Paul's description of love? How's it measure up? Only you can answer that. God knows the answer. In our dealings with others, whether it be friends, whether it be family, whether it be foe, how do we measure up? Remember, without love, our labor, the good things we do in the name of Christ, are meaningless. They're nothing. So are we committed to walking in this better way that Paul talked about and yet I show you a more excellent way imitate Christ his character, his love see Char I got through that and nobody fell out the window from being asleep like Eutychicus did, didn't have to bring your breakfast <laughs> uh, I think it was, I think it was uh, Janice that asked me about uh, the, the, about Eutychicus I thought it was going to fall out of a window in a smoky room uh, anyway if you are subject to the gospel call in any way, we encourage you this evening that as we stand and sing, that if we can help you in any way with that relationship with God that you need, we encourage you to come and also to the folks at home 
Uh, again, if you need a copy of the text that I uh, present this evening, please text, text me, and I'll be glad to send it to you. And if we can help you at home in any way. And we certainly have the, the uh, Pettit family in our prayers and others, but uh, they're, they're really going through some rough time with, uh, with Steve and, and Jean and now uh, Nancy. So we certainly uh, would encourage everyone to keep them in your prayers. But if we can help you with any way uh, with your relationship with God, we'd encourage you to come while together we stand while we sing the songs been selected. this evening before a closing word of prayer. If not, Bobby will lead us in our closing word of prayer. Let us pray together. God, our Father in heaven, we come to you in prayer this evening to, again, thank you for the honor and privilege to be here another Lord's Day and, and listen to another word, another lesson of thy word. We appreciate Dave and Mike as they brought the lessons to us today that if we will understand it, take it out to each other's. We ask you to be all those who are on the prayer list, those who are mentioned and uh, have a cobra, we just ask you to watch over them. Be with us as we leave this place tonight and help us focus on you through the week, not just on Sundays or on Wednesdays. In your son's name we pray, amen.